هو الله الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى أما بعد فقد قال الله عز وجل في القرآن المجيد والفرقان الحميد وإذ قلتم يا موسى لن نؤمن لك حتى نرى الله جهرة صدق الله مولانا العظيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد المعظم الجود والكرم وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم وصل عليه In the previous lecture we embarked upon the uh, uh, happenings of Bani Israel but one of the questions which I raised on the previous occasion uh, towards the end was a very important question why are we being told about Bani Israel? that is a very critical question if I was to say uh, I'm going to tell you about a, a story about some uh, Chinese dynasty 3000 years ago um, your first question is what's the relevance to me? And why are you wasting my time trying to talk to me about some Yongdong dynasty two, three thousand years ago? There has to be a, a, a relevance to me and to my uh, life. The Quran emphasizes uh, not only uh, uh, Bani Israel but also other previous nations, but specifically Bani Israel because. In terms of uh, 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 prophets, Bani Israel uh, had the majority of prophets that came to them. That was the source of their eminence. There were other uh, um, nations that came on this world, but the preponderance of 124,000 prophets that came, there was a significant proportion that came to Bani Israel. Hence, that was the source of their um uh, uh, respect and their status whereas to us there is only one prophet who came yet our status comparatively is greater than them because the prophet who came to us was uh, uh, greater in status than all the prophets that collectively came to Bani Israel however the question that re- begs to be and uh, I gave you status over the Alameen. Bani Israel were given there. We were given the status of Kuntum Khaira Ummah. You are the best of Ummah. So you're not just best in terms of one uh, 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 time as Bani Israel were. They were the best in their time. But we are, and our superiority is not restricted to time or to a particular geography. The entire earth is the Ummah of Rasulullah in terms of humans. Of course, there are non-humans who are his Ummati, but for this purpose, we are his Ummati. So, uh, uh, we are, uh, um, my, my thread of thought is just slightly withered there. Um, we are um, uh, superior in without limitation of time, even though our Prophet is not physically in front of us. And uh, uh, his nabuwat carries on. But uh, the awliya of Bani Israel who were mentioned, and previous nations who were mentioned in the Qur'an, this is a, a point which is better addressed now. What is their status in comparison to the awliya of the ummah of Rasulullah Their name is mentioned in the Qur'an. So it would appear that they are more superior. I'm not talking about individual individual awliya in the Quran, but collectively, the awliya of the ummah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam are greater in status than the awliya of all previous ummahs. Why? Not because of the caliber of their wilaya, but because of their association with Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So uh, uh, we also, as humans, are superior to previous nations. Not because there is something in us, but because of our association to Rasulullah The question then still raise, uh, I, 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 that begs to be answered is why 
is the Quran emphasizing stories of the past? Clearly, there has to be a relevance, and the Prophet والسلام, in a hadith upon this in Sahih Muslim. And again, the translators of this uh, hadith haven't uh, reflected the grammar uh, of this. Uh, uh, the Prophet وسلم, said, Zurur biz Zurur, and uh, most translators of uh, English uh, haven't reflected this grammar and the emphasis in this grammar. For sure, without any element of the Lam Taqeed and Noon Saqeed, there is no shadow of doubt. Latatabi'anna, uh, without any doubt, you will follow Sanan al Ladina min Kablikum, the footpaths of those people before you. Those Nations before you. Shibran bi shibrin, inch by inch, zira'an bi zira'in, step by step. Hatta da khalufi hujri dhabbin, even if they led you uh, uh, to the den of a lizard. Now, the Prophet is educating us that in the past, even if they had committed, the, uh, 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 committed themselves to a path, in which there was so much danger, because naturally the den of a lizard, as Sir David Attenborough now tells us, is a most dangerous place. Even an encounter with a lizard is something. But the den of a lizard is a very fortified uh, place. And once you are in the vicinity of that, you are considered a threat. And the lizard will deal with you, depending on its size. But of course the Prophet ﷺ was referring to uh, the uh, uh, obnoxious and uh, and and evil and um, and poisonous lizards, uh, where even their saliva can cause you uh, 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 serious harm. So uh, the people of the past, even if they went to a path which landed them into such uh, uh, magnitude of danger as going to the den of a lizard, uh, uh, the Prophet said, "You will for sure, for sure, follow them." So. You are being told by your Prophet, be careful, Allah is telling you about Bani Israel because you will follow them. And we don't reflect, we say, well, you know, our life is very different to Bani Israel. But no, as we go through these waqiyat, you will see, oh, we have these same things. Now, I don't want to digress too much, but one of the traits of Bani Israel, which we have already encountered, is a morality. Uh, Bani Israel uh, went to an estate where homosexuality was, uh, or should I now say LGBT was, uh, in its in its you know uh, uh, magnitude in history, uh, uh, you know LGBT found its uh, 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 prominence in Bani Israel in such a manner that the uh, uh, um, uh, the uh, sexualization of the civilization of Bani Israel became so advanced that it became a norm to engage in immorality. And remember uh, uh, the verse of the Qur'an I often quote, أَفَمَنْ زُيِّنَ لَهُ سُوْ عَمَلِهِ فَرَعَاهُ حَسَنَا A time comes when their evil is presented to them in their eyes as good, and they think we're doing good. Now, they engaged in immorality at that. I don't need to go into detail. LGBT summarizes it all. Rights for the uh, 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 um, uh, 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 for homosexuals, rights for lesbians, their right. I mean, if you look at how within a space of uh, sixty years, how uh, 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 there's been a huge cultural change in ninety up to nineteen sixty seven, it was a criminal offence in the United Kingdom to engage in a homosexual act. A criminal offence, you could go to jail. Whether someone went to jail or not is a se separate issue. But it was a criminal offence. Professor Wolfenden uh, commissioned a uh, law commission and uh, uh, recommended in a report that the state should not interfere with the lives of the individuals because it is breach of their liberty. That was the Wolfenden report. W-O-L. F. Wolfenden report. And as a result of that report of Professor Wolfenden, 
law was passed to decriminalize homosexuality. So up to 67, societal norm was that this is wrong. If you got caught, you would get, if you allow me to use a street word, you would get nicked. If you got caught, you would get nicked. 67 decriminalized it, but people still consider it to be, to, to be a wrong. In fact, people uh, 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 um, persecuted people who were uh, of you know, such orientation. Now, 67 to now, where are we? 2002, any mathematicians? How many years later? 67 to 55. I wasn't far off when I said 60. So 55, 60 years later, there is such a shift that forget about the criminalization or decriminalization of uh, homosexuality, now it is a criminal offense to condemn homosexuality. Can you see how within 55, 60 years everything has changed? So Bani Israel also went through a similar phase. It's not that someone woke up in the morning and said, right, I'm going to tell everyone I'm, you know, queer. <laughs> it's one of those things. No, there was a systematic social uh, movement towards the normalization and again uh, best way to uh, rather than saying homosexuality and lesbianism and all that which comes with it LGBT summarizes it fantastically all this hoo-ha you know the gender issues the, the binary issues uh, it all summarizes so LGBT was a uh, a phenomena of Bani Israel and uh, uh, they practiced it as a social norm. So much so that the Prophet ﷺ said, my ummah will imitate this. And what do you have before you? The rise of LGBT. This is a legacy of Bani Israel, which uh, 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 appears, this is the promise of Rasulullah Sallallahu Everything that they did, so when you uh, 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 go through these waqiyah, I don't think this is just a Jack and Ori, once upon a time, this happened and, oh yes, it was a nice story. No, you have to evaluate. This is Allah talking to you. And you have to evaluate, am I the recipient or is there a lesson for me? The answer is yes, there is a lesson for you. But one of you will deduct a different lesson from this based on your life and another will deduct a different lesson. It's not just about let's tell stories. It's about what is the relevance of this story to me? So, uh, I just want to slightly backtrack because I missed uh, 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 one portion last time when we talked about the uh, uh, worship of the cow. Now, you have to understand the circumstances. Uh, Bani Israel didn't just wake up one morning and say, let's start uh, 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 disobeying Allah. It wasn't uh, as systematic as that. You have to understand this is a people who have been in the company of prophets, not one prophet, many prophets. We often say, that if you have the company of a wali, you are blessed. But here you had people who had the company of not only a nabi, ulul azam nabi. <laughs> you know that chair which often is recited in Gyarmi Sharif's Yak Zamana Sobate Ba'awliya, Betel Az Sad Sala Itaate Beria. I say, oh, you one moment in the companionship of a wali. No. It's not just the companionship, it's what you bring to the table. And what is it that you bring to the table? It's not worldly chattels or uh, uh, worldly uh, uh, material that you bring. You bring the first thing that you bring to the table, whether it's awliya or ambiya, is ikhlas, sincerity. Sure. The quest of I am in a quest. When a person goes to uh, uh, Aulia, I've, I've mentioned this to you many times, people say, oh, I sat in the company of this person, you know, he, uh, uh, I didn't see any uh, uh, karamat of his, or like the person who said, uh, uh, I went to uh, 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 Justice uh, Peer Karam Shah, rahmatullahi, and I asked him to do them for my headache, and he, uh, there was no difference. So I decided he's not a wali Allah. <laughs> so we weigh people based on, uh, 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 you know, whether they can deliver whether they can deliver. And if, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, what we consider a wali doesn't deliver, even if uh, 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 some rishi or some shishi, uh, uh, you know, charges it as long as the job gets done. That's all we're concerned with. The job gets done. How it gets done, through which ilm, we don't care. We want the job done. We are so obsessed with dunya, 
that we don't. And so therefore our measure of awliya is, can they help us? Have they helped us in dunya? And if they don't help us in dunya, we say, oh, no, you know, that, 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 that seriously questions whether they are uh, a value or not. So, uh, uh, um, you know, the, the, of course, if they choose to help, like the Prophet ﷺ was walking past and there were some farmers, they asked him a question. And the Prophet ﷺ gave an answer. And uh, his answer did not uh, 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 um, benefit them in what they were seeking. And some idiot. Uh, idiotic scholars, they say, well, you see, the Prophet ﷺ didn't know matters of dunya. What he was educating us was that, look, I am here for a purpose. You know, you should exercise your better judgment. Of course I can tell you the, 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 the crop that you yield, they are my ummatis. This land which you uh, use, this land is my ummati. I know the reality of my ummati. How can a Nabi be a Nabi if he doesn't know his ummati? <laughs> so some stupid scholars, they say, oh, you see, the Prophet ﷺ didn't know. But no, he was teaching them the education that, look, you know, I uh, uh, think, so, sorry, what was I saying? I just sli- slightly lost my trail. Sincerity. When you go. Sincerity. So we measure awliya by uh, 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 X, and we have these stereotypes in our mind. If they fit that stereotype... They are of the Avalila. If they don't fit that stereotype, they're not. And that's it. All we are concerned with is does the job get done? And if it doesn't get job, uh, 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 the, the job doesn't get done, we're not interested. But if the measure of a Vali is Karamat, then we are on a head on collision, head on collision with Dajjal and his forces. Because that's what Dajjal will do. He'll say, You want a Karamat? I'll give you Karamat. You want a miracle? I'll give you a miracle. And you don't need to wait till the Jal, the, the, the jal and his coming. His uh, 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 deputies have already started uh, uh, committing what we call miracles. Walking on water. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, uh, walking on this, walking on... What's his name? Dynamo. 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 plane and all these. This is not magic, by the way. This is not magic, because magic is different. In fact... One of the ways to dilute the word sorcery is they used the word magic. And to make it racist, they call it black magic. <laughs> they call it black magic. As the woman who came to me one day, and she said, I think someone has done kala jadu on me. And I said, Nini kala nahi pila. <laughs> she said, Pila kyu? I said, Kala kyu? It's just a stereotype, isn't it? It's been planted in our head, black. You know, as a racist thing. So, uh, uh, magic. But magic is an illusion to the eye. And there's nothing uh, wrong with that. I can do a magic trick. Well, I can't. But if I did a magic trick, there's nothing wrong with that. But to dilute the seriousness of sorcery. Well, now we've got Harry Potter. We don't have to worry. (laughs) Because it's all fun and games. But uh, 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 to dilute sorcery, uh, 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 black magic comes into the equation. So... um, uh, 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 through uh, uh, Dajjal's deputies, he's already showing you, look, we're walking on water. Look, we are uh, doing this. So if your measure is miracle, well, then you're on a head-on collision with the wrong forces. The issue is, what do you bring to the table? The first thing is sincerity. Sincerity in what? What are you sincere for? Sincere in your quest. What is your quest? What is your quest? 99% of people who go to uh, uh, so-called peers or Murshid, their, their quest is dunya. Allah. Their quest is not Allah. But the quest of, the real quest is, La maqsood illa Allah. I don't want anything other than Allah. I've come to you for Allah. And if I, I don't care how much dunya I get through you or through your dua, that's not my measure. My measure is how much Allah do I get from you. And if I don't get Allah from you, then... And, there are signs, there are telltale signs of whether you have proximity to Allah. There's no machine that you can say, how was I? One of the telltale signs is, I've already told you this, stability. Look at how much stability was in your life and look at how much stability is as a result of your association. If you are mukhlis. Anyway, it's a different topic. I don't want to dive into that. But what Bani Isra and I, I, and this is one of the reasons why I mentioned this, it wasn't just to highlight LGBT. Also, one of the uh, 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 aspects of Bani Israel was uh, uh, sorcery. Sorcery was uh, a common feature. 
So when the Prophet says, uh, 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 um, Shibran bi Shibrin, inch by inch, this includes sorcery. We are now, this generation, 2022, we stand at the dawn, dawn of where sorcery is being introduced to us as fun and games. And we don't buy it because we think, oh, well, it's just, uh, you know, a Thursday evening or Friday evening entertainment. But our children will subliminally inherit values so that when real sorcery comes in front of them, their mind will be neutralized. You know, and I often give this example if you haven't heard before. Uh, um, you know, even now a mice is a, a mouse is a sign of vice, of uh, you know, lack of cleanliness. If there is a mouse in a restaurant, you know, the council can shut that you know, uh, place down if it's not uh, dealt with. So even now, you ask anyone, mouse? It's, oh, mouse. But Hollywood has uh, tested our minds by bringing a mouse into our house called Mickey Mouse. And our children. And it's, this is just an experiment. Uh, you know, toying with us. Look, we can introduce a. Likewise, the jal is one-eyed. Now, if you ask anyone, what do you think of a one-eyed? Of course, one-eyed monster, horrible. But Hollywood has introduced the one-eyed monster, Monster Inc. You see, different cartoons with one eyes to introduce into the mind of that child that look, this is it. So we are at the dawn. Up till now, there's a ceasefire, I often say this. There's a ceasefire. The other side haven't performed their, you know, well they are, David Blaine. But the day David Blaine or any of these people, at the moment they use their powers, uh, shaitani powers, for entertainment. And in history, if you use uh, uh, um, uh, 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 sorcery for entertainment, there's been no comebacks. There's been no comebacks. But the day David Blaine announces a deen based on this, follow me, there will be a reaction from the other side. So, right, come on then. You know the example I gave you of Sayyid Ali Hajwari, who said, all right, come on then, come down. You see, so there will be, uh, at the moment there is a ceasefire. For the last 100, 150 years, in fact 200 years, there is a ceasefire. That's why you don't see open uh, uh, miracles of awliya. But you will begin to see them when uh, a sorcery starts to take its uh, you know, colors. So at the moment it's being infused in our mind, the minds of our generations, by saying it's entertainment, it's fun and games, you know, it's nice, oh, look what he did, amazing. There's no label to it. But the moment you put a label to it, that's the source of ittiba. Ah, you follow these people. See, these people have power, they have the knowledge, they have the, uh, the thing. And so that's what ultimately is the ambition of Hollywood to take you in that direction you know Bollywood was stuck on love stories till the 90s but then they realized oops we've got to change our films and our dramas so now they are introducing themes which are mimicking Hollywood they are you know at the tail of uh, Hollywood so these movements are designed to infuse characteristics of Bani Israel in you and those characteristics are mentioned in the Qur'an. So with, I thought it was important to give this background again uh, and emphasize it to show that we are mimicking what Bani Israel uh, uh, has been doing. And it's not just the immorality. Sorcery is at the... Uh, uh, we are at the dawn of, uh, of the advent of explicit sorcery. But at the moment it's just in the name of entertainment. So that's not, uh, uh, there's no reaction from this camp. The, uh, uh, and, and, and this vaqiyah of Bani Israel is a symbol of that sorcery also. What happened was, when Musa went, um, uh, when he went for 40 days, when he went for 40 days uh, 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 to uh, 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 converse with Allah Azza wa Jal, uh, in his absence, he left his naib, Hazrat Harun salam, and Despite the presence of Harun alayhi salam, there was a, 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 an alim, his name was Samiri, mentioned in the Quran. And Samiri 
was, if I just tell you the history of Samiri, you'll be actually be very shocked. Samiri was a fostered child. Fostered child. Do you know who his foster, foster carer was? You'll be shocked. Samiri, when he was born, at that time, Fir'aun had said, kill all children. No boys should be spared. So when Samari was born, his mother left him in a cave, thinking that something would happen and he would uh, uh, survive. And indeed, when he, she left him in the cave, now look at this. this, this is the biography of someone, look what he did in the end. It shows you, it's not what you've got, it's what you do with what you've got. Remember these words. It's not what you've got, it's what you do with what, and remember these words in the end of what I tell you about Samiri. Samiri was abandoned by his mother, not purposely abandoned, uh, to protect him from being chopped up by the forces of Fir'aun, who were uh, insecure and thought that if a child goes through the net, that could be the, 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 the promised uh, person who brings down Fir'aun. Because his, Fir'aun's uh, sorcerers have told him that the person who's going to bring you down is coming. So Fir'aun's response was, well, kill all the boys. You know, that, that, that's the e- easiest solution. You know, and and, and, uh, uh, and Fir'aun uh, brought that into action. But in the cave, in the cave, uh, uh, when Bani, uh, uh, when uh, he was left by his mother, um, Allah Azza wa Jal sent a foster carer called Jibreel alayhi salam. An angel, an angel was sent, and not any ordinary angel. You know the biography. He's he's top brass angel. You know top brass angel. Ulul Azam, and then from the Ulul Azam. He is the president of the confederation of angelic soup aristocracy. <laughs> From the confederation of angelic aristocracy. Uh, and, 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 and Jibreel, not any other angel, was given the task to foster this child. He started off by putting honey in his lips and you know caring for him. Up to a point when this child grew up under the supervision of Jibreel alayhi salam, Jibreel used to come in human form and he used to uh, ride a horse, you know, as any human would do. But this child saw that wherever the foot of the horse of Jibreel touched, if it touched on uh, sand, that sand would become green. Yani life would emanate not from Jibreel's mass. Look. If it was Jibreel's mass, then we could say, yeah, angel touched earth. No, 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 no. This is, look at the nisbat. This is not Jibreel, this is the horse of Jibreel. The foot that touches a barren land of Jibreel's horse gives life. (laughs) So people say that, oh, the Prophet couldn't give life. Jibreel is his khadim. Uh-huh. If his khadim, and not only him, if his khadim's horse can give life. <laughs> so to say, did the Prophet ﷺ give life? I mean, that's, that's like, a, you know, I mean, where the, the, the servant can do such a task, you know. Uh, what, what is the thing? It's like, I often use this example when Imam Busiri was asked by the Prophet ﷺ. Ask Busiri, what do you want from me? He said, Ya Rasulullah, uh, I ask that I have a disease, give, uh, Allah give me shafa. He said, Busiri, this is something that my friends can offer you. <laughs> ask me something that only I can give you. <laughs> and Busiri was overwhelmed. What can I ask the Prophet ﷺ, which only he can give? So then he threw his burda towards him. Only this burda can be given by Muhammad or Rasulullah. <laughs> anyway, I'm not going to repeat that uh, uh, vaqiyah. So, uh, uh, this is something which uh, their uh, uh, khadim can do. Anyway, so his uh, uh, fo- the horse's shoe used to touch on the floor and it used to give life to the dead barren earth. Samari grew up with this. So what Samari did was that he took a piece of that, um, he took a piece of that uh, 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 sand where he took a piece of that, looks, he took a piece of that sand which had been touched, not is touched, 
<laughs> when we go to Medina Munawwara and we do ziyara, the Prophet ﷺ touched this place. And then they ah, bidah, bidah, bidah. Well, you should tell Musa alayhi salam. You should tell that you were harboring a bidati. It's not that Jibreel touched now. He touched in the past. And the nisbat of that dust remained in... The, the, the power was in the hoof of the horse, right? But the nisbat with that soil meant that now that soil inherited the same property as the horse, the shoe of the horse. This is what we call nisbat. Nisbat, yani, the uh, uh, barren land had association with the uh, uh, foot of the horse of Jibreel and it retained its property of giving life. It's retained its property of giving life. Do, do, do you see how huge this is? When we go to Medina Munawwara and we see Tabarrukat, the Najdi says, oh no, these Tabarrukat. No, the fact that if a piece of dust once upon a time touched the foot of the horse of Jibreel has the property to give life and to do miracles, can you imagine those Asare Qadima? Those now you can understand why what takhadu min maqami Ibrahim Musalla. My Ibrahim has put his footprint on this place. Don't think this is an ordinary footprint. Don't think this is just a relic in a museum. The barakah of the foot of Ibrahim Islam results that even today <coughs> you can read namaz anywhere. But when you come to Maqam Ibrahim, you read namaz here because of the nisbat of Ibrahim. It's so what about nisbat? Anyway, so uh, uh, Samani was very, you know, he thought, oh, this is very good. I can do some tricks with this. So he started using that soil for his, uh, 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 for, for, uh, I wouldn't say magic, because uh, uh, he's A, not been authorized by Jibreel alayhi salam. He's seen it and he's used it. Anyway, uh, that's how it all starts, isn't it? You know, I was t- telling you about this Sifli knowledge. Many uh, Amils today, 99.9% of Amils, whether they are Alims or peace, they practice Sifli. <laughs> this is halal. Why? Because we are uh, calling Jinnah to uh, 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 do jobs for us. Well, it's fine. You call Jinnah, but then you call fire. Then there's consequences of that. So, in the beginning, Samani used uh, 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 that power from the uh, uh, mud uh, that touched uh, the uh, footstep of the horse of Jibreel. Uh, he used that for his own purpose. And in the end, because he was very learned, he had had the company of Musa salam, and Harun salam, very learned, he used his knowledge. Look how he used it, subhanAllah. Look how he used his knowledge. Maybe I should tell you a joke at this time. So it will just ease it up because you're all sitting as if you're in the Crown Court on a charge for uh, 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 talk, taking vehicle without uh, permission. <laughs> uh, uh, what was I saying? Yes, joke. So uh, you know there, were, there was a crow and a you know and a you know batera, quail. They were both flying, and the uh, as they were flying, they were having a chit chat with each other, and suddenly, suddenly. They both got caught in a trap. And the quail was crying, Hi, hi, Margia, hi, hi, Margia, hi. This person who set this trap, if he finds me, he's going to bake me. He's going to fry, I'm going to be barbecue tonight. Anyway, the crow also got stuck. He was also crying, Hi, hi, Margia, hi, hi. And the uh, potato, the, the quail said to him, Oh, what's your problem? You're haram. <laughs> When the person who uh, uh, sees your, uh, you trapped in the net, he's going to say, crow, oh God, he's alarmed, let him go. The uh, uh, crow said, yeah, yeah, I thought that, oh, I know that must lie also. But the problem is, this trap belongs to an alim. <laughs> when he sees me, he's going to do some healer, he's going to some fine excuse, and he's going to slaughter me. <laughs> 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 so I know this is a uh, thing. So Samiri was an alim, and he wasn't a normal person, he was an alim, and he was an abid. He was a, 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 an extraordinary companion of Musa with power. But then look what he did. As soon as Musa al-Islam went, Harun al-Islam was a very soft, temperamented person. You know, every prophet has their own personality. That's why many awliya say that uh, if you look at awliya, you will see a reflection of a particular prophet uh, 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 in them. 
So you have Hudi Oliya, you have Isri Oliya, you have uh, uh, Dawudi Oliya, you have uh, uh, Oliya who represent the characteristics of, uh, characteristics of Yahya alayhi salam, Zakariya alayhi salam, and the most superior Oliya are Muhammadi Oliya, those who represent the characteristics of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam. Yeah, so uh, 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 Harun alayhi salam was very soft hearted, very, but he did his job, he knew his job. There was no problems with his job. So when uh, Sa'amani saw Musa Islam had gone, he told all Bani, because they had brought all their jewelry with them. You know, uh, they were businessmen, so they bought all their jewelry with them. So he said to them, oh, this jewelry which you bought is all haram. He gave a fatwa, this is haram. <laughs> so they said, oh, really? He said, yeah, this is haram. So he said, what do we do? He said, well, put it all together and we'll light a fire and we'll just get rid of it. So on the face of it, he wasn't asking it for himself, but by then, he had been using that uh, 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 um, power and had tested that power on so many occasions, so much so that he had become an agent of shaitan. Initially, he was in sobat of Musa alayhi salam, ulul azam prophet. But that sobat did not benefit him because his quest was power. It wasn't Allah. It wasn't Allah. And so therefore, and I'm, telling, I'm going to tell you in a minute what happened to those people whose quest was Allah. There were those around Musa Islam whose quest was La Maqsood illa, uh, 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 la maqsud, uh, illa Allah. But Samiri, his quest was dunya. So for him it was all about spiritual power. It's all about power. So when Musa Islam left, he got the uh, uh, jewelry, got it burnt, and then shaped it in the form of a um, calf. And when he threw that um, dust which he had gathered from the footsteps of the horse of Jibreel, when he threw that in the fire upon the jewelry, lo and behold, it turned into a living calf. Yeah, calf. Not a cow, a calf. Not quite there. But it turned into a calf. And the calf began to make noises. And so he said... This is the uh, uh, God that Musa alayhi salam has gone to. And Bani Israel, they were so blinded because their quest wasn't Allah. Their quest was, well, our jewelry has turned and they began to follow Samari. And they came uh, and they started prostrating to and uh, uh, worshipping the calf. Even now, if you go to uh, uh, um, Jabal Musa, you can see in, in the stone itself, is the imprint of the calf. Even now, today, if you go to Jabal Musa on your holiday, do visit that site uh, uh, where, uh, not Kohetu, Jabal Musa is. Uh, anyway, so he threw it and they started worshipping. Musa alayhi salam came down and he, Farraja uh, Musa ila qawmihi ghadbana asifa. Musa alayhi salam returned to his people very angry. What have you done? And the first thing he did was rather than uh, 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 grab uh, the people or Samiri, the first thing he did, called his deputy, Harun alayhi salam. And what did he do? The Quran says, he grabbed his beard and his, the hair of his head, he must have had you know, uh, uh, long hair, and he pulled it. Now I ask you this question. Disrespecting the hair of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, according to the fatawa of the majority of Ahlul Sunnah, just the hair, just the muay mubarak, disrespecting that willfully is kufr. Unintentionally, it's fisk, but willfully is kufr. If you say this is the hair of the Prophet and you purposely dis, that's kufr, right? Willfully disrespecting the hair of any, uh, 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 forget, uh, 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 prophet, of any mu'min. You know, the Prophet ﷺ did tawaf around the Kaaba, stopped, looked at the Kaaba and said, وَالَّذِي نَفْسُ مُحَمَّدٍ بِيَدِي I swear by Allah, لَحُرْمَةُ الْمُؤْمِنِ عَازَمُ مِنْ حُرْمَتِكَ The sanctity of a mu'min is greater than you, O Kaaba. The sanctity of a mu'min. لَحُرْمَةُ الْمُؤْمِنِ 
Uh, some ulama do is, uh, you know, the istimbat here, al-mu'min refers to only salih mu'min or, you know, uh, pious mu'min. No, al-mu'min, alif lam, jinsi, all mu'min. As long as they are in iman, their hurma, their sanctity is greater than the Kaaba. So, uh, defying the sanctity of the Kaaba, defying the sanctity of the Kaaba is a sin. Yeah? And imagine defying the sanctity of a mu'min. Well, we do that every day. We don't care. Why? Because politics. We are so engrossed in politics. We don't care about the hurmat of a mu'min. Anyway, that's a separate subject. But if the hurmat of a mu'min is greater than the Kaaba, can you imagine the hurmat of a mu'min a kamil? Can you imagine the hurma, the sanctity of a prophet? Now, if you disrespect a, the hurmat of a prophet, that is kufr. Pulling a beard is not an act of respect, is it? Pulling the hair. But here the Quran talks about pulling the hair off the beard and the hair. Can you imagine the ferociousness of the act? And Musa uh, Harun says, he doesn't say, Oi, what are you doing? I'm a prophet. No, he says, Don't pull my hair. I did my job. He didn't say, well, I'm going to pass fatwa on you. Look, you, you've defied my sanctity. No, I'm a prophet. No. The lesson from that is that, and this is very important. The lesson from that vaqia is that if two people of eminence perform an act which defies your logic, because our logic says respect of prophet is incumbent upon us. And disrespect of prophet is kufr. Everyone happy with that? So on the face of it, a prophet has been disrespected. But do we now cast a fatwa upon Musa alayhi salam? The uh, ulama at this point say, when two people of superiority engage with each other and it defies your logic, shut your mouth. (laughs) Shut your gob. Don't say, well, the logic says that the respect of a prophet is very important and therefore Musa alayhi salam... Shut your mouth. That is a matter between Musa and Harun. You have been told that if you do it, it's kufr. If Musa does it, why not? It goes back to what I said to you four uh, sessions ago. The sharia of a Nabi is different to our sharia. In our sharia, it's kufr. In their sharia, it's allowed. So there was no uh, 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 response of Musa, of Harun al-Islam, or even from Allah that you disrespected my Prophet, no? In their Sharia, so for us the hukam is, if you don't understand, shut your gob. And the same rule applies of shut your gob to Sahaba. When they dispute with each other, you don't say, well, you know, this is right. Of course we say that, al-haqqu ma'al ali, we say that. But because on the other side, there are people who are labeled, who have the label of Sahaba, therefore we shut our mouths. Why? Because there is a position of respect, a label of respect there. We can deduce from that that yes, Hazrat Ali was in haq, no problem. But beyond that, to go and then to criticize or to, 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 to open, no. Why? The Quran teaches us when you are dealing with people who are of, of a different category to yourself, Forget Sahaba. When your parents argue with each other, you are not entitled to interfere and say, Mother, you are right, or Father, you are right, as is done today. Because that's what we're taught to do, express our views. But if a parent has a, if parents have dispute with each other, the child is told, shut your mouth. Why? One is your Kaaba and one is your Qibla. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you side with your Kaaba, you will disrespect your Qibla. If you side with the Qibla, you will disrespect your Kaaba. So, parents, you know, and, and so therefore, uh, Musa alayhi salam uh, uh, did this. So when Musa alayhi salam did this, they, uh, some of them did Tawbah and some of them carried on. So Musa, and this is very important, Musa alayhi salam, then, before he asked Allah for uh, um, forgiveness for these people, those who would ask for forgiveness, he turned to Samri and he gave Baddua to Samri. <laughs> he gave Baddua to Samri. You will burn in hell. You will this. 
And look at, this is the methodology of Kalimullah. But look at the methodology of Habibullah. Allah. The one who stoned him, the one who persecuted him, he still said, Rabbi habli ummati, Rabbi habli ummati. Look at this difference in style. Allah. So Musa alayhi salam asked for forgiveness from Allah for them. And, and, and they asked for forgiveness. But first Musa alayhi salam asked for forgiveness. Vasila. There's four kinds of Vasila. We'll talk about Vasila properly. Four kinds of Vasila which... Unfortunately, no one has actually written about, especially in the Ahl Sunnah. But there's four aqsam of wasila that are in the Quran, which we will talk about at the right point. Let's let's move on in this. So they uh, uh, Musa Islam gave him badua, and then he said to Bani Israel, uh, 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 "Do tawba." Some of them did tawba. Those who did not do tawba, they were told. The ones who did tawba were told. You're gonna laugh at this. They were told. Charge. Kill them. Yeah. Because they have defied uh, the law of Allah Azza wa Jal. They, didn't, they were arrogant. They didn't do Toba. So they were told to kill. Anyway, now turning to those people who uh, were naik, who were pious in Bani Israel. So these were the, 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 the Awam. Now we're talking about the khawas of Bani Israel. According to uh, uh, narrations, uh, there were up to 70 uh, people. And we can translate that to mean they were awliya of Musa alayhi salam. So they went to Musa alayhi salam and they said to him, Can we come with you to tour to hear Allah? And Musa alayhi salam said, Fine. He didn't say, No, no, closed club, private members only. No, come. So when they approached Kohetur, subhanallah, Musa alayhi salam, when, uh, so a cloud came over the mountain. Uh, what is the significance of that cloud? Well, some other time we'll talk about that. But a cloud came over. Them. They saw, when a cloud comes, it becomes dark, isn't it? But in daylight, when the cloud came over that mountain, these 70 people heard Allah Azza wa Jal talk. And this is in hadith. They heard, they, you know, minhum, you know the Quran says, minhum man kallam Allah. Minhum is not one. Allah. <laughs> Talk. Allah. Man kallam Allah. There was kalam with Allah, there is plural. Hum. Huwa, huma, hum. There is not one who talk, there are many who talk to Allah. But these awliya, they heard now, the question which uh, is raised here, what did they hear? Was that audibility, what they heard, the noise, the voice? Was that makhluk or was it khaliq? Mm. That's a separate topic we'll, which we'll discuss on a separate occasion. Because if I go there, then we're going to have to talk about Mu'tazila and what they believe and all of that. But they heard, there's a hadith. They heard, uh, Tabri uh, brings this hadith, and many other mufassin have brought this hadith. They heard Allah. When they heard Allah, uh, now imagine that. Oh, sorry, I forgot one point. When they saw Musa salam, speak to Allah, every time Allah would speak to Musa salam, his face used to glow. Musa salam's face used to glow. It used to glow so much that he would put parda upon it. Allah. That's how much. And then uh, 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 Musa alayhi salam used to say, I could see, uh, uh, I read a narration very long time ago, he, should, he said, I could see in pitch dark ants 300 miles away. Because of the noor of the majesty, tajalla of Allah azza wa jal. 300 miles away. And that's not a, 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 a phenomenon that's, uh, 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 that's um, uh, you know, something that, that's, uh, it is astonishing, but in the Quran there's many examples of such astonishing vaqiyat. Uh, 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 I don't want to go into detail, but Musa he used to cover his face when the radiance of the kalam of Allah used to come upon him. And imagine that privilege that these people had, that they heard what did they do? Rather than saying, thank you very much. Oh, that was nice. Oh, we found Allah. They said, وَإِذْ قُلْتُمْ يَا مُوسَىٰ لَن نُؤْمِنَ لَكَ And remember, uh, what is 
there is a, and again I repeat this for barakah, in wa is there is a fail which is mahzuf, a hidden fail, a hidden verb. Wa is the verb that's hidden is hidden is vazkur or yad kijiye. And Allah is talking to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Zara, mere mehboob zara yad kijiye na. You only say like I say to Maulana Hasnain Sam. I say yad kijiye. Hamari mulaqat Pretoria mein hui. So I'm only saying yad kijiye because I met him. If I didn't meet him. How could Allah. I say Yad? So Allah is saying, Oh my beloved, Adra Yad ki diena. And you were there. <laughs> you were there. You witnessed what happened. So what is this is the secret of what is fail ma'zuf and what was good. Yad ki diye. What is kultum ya Musa? When we said, Oh Musa, uh, when they said, Oh Musa, lan nu'mina. Look at this language. Lan nu'mina. It's not, we won't believe. This lan upon muzaria gives a grammatical emphasis that hargiz never, ever, ever will we. No, in English we don't have that emphasis. Shakespeare didn't introduce it because you know the the the, the impact of uh, English literature uh, was upon uh, um, the substance of words, not on certain the or not on the emphasis that Arabic language gives. Anyway, I better not open that door, uh, but. Uh, uh, we will never Oi, you Joey, you've just heard Allah You've just seen The radiance on Musa Is that not enough for you? But they said no We will never believe in you and What stupidity And yet these were pious people of Bani Israel. We will hargiz nahi manenge. We won't believe. Hatta narallaha jahratan. Unless we don't see Allah explicitly. Do you see how the human mind works? This is atheism in Bani Israel. The seeds of atheism were so engrossed in them that firstly they asked for well, we want to be privy to a conversation. They were given that privilege. And just after that, I mean, you would think, come on. You would think. I mean, there are awliya that walk on this earth who have had one experience. Some have had two experiences. And that one experience is enough for them for their whole lifetime. <laughs> this is an experience where an ulul azam prophet is with you. You are hearing and privy to a conversation with Allah. But despite that, they say, no. Atheism, that seed of atheism... Requires no more, more, more evidence. Let not, until we don't see him, we're not going to believe. So they casted doubt upon the whole affair, thinking, no, unless we don't see him. So then Allah, فَأَتَّخَذْ تُكُمُ الْسَعِكَ So uh, 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 lightning came, وَأَنْتُمْ تَنْزُرُونَ And you saw what happened. So <coughs> Allah Azza wa Jal was very cross with them. He said, look, I gave you this privilege of seeing. And then lightning came and they died. They actually died with lightning. I mean, it wasn't a case of, well, it was an accident. <laughs> it was Allah's punishment. They died. They actually died because they did kufran and ni'mat. They did not uh, appreciate Allah's ni'mat upon them. Musa salam saw 70 men dead and he said, this is not good for PR. This is not good for marketing. And when I go back, then they say, oh, 70, where are they gone? What have you done with them? Yeah. Same issue with uh, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sayyidina Umar said, Ya Rasulullah, why don't you kill these munafiks? You know who they are. He said, no, no, people will say that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam killed his companions. Yet they had the title companions, but they weren't even a mu'min. So they were just having a title. <coughs> you know, if you say you were Zameen Dar, but you don't have a Zameen, then you're just a Dar. <laughs> you can call yourself Zameen Dar, but if you have no Zameen, you're just a Dar. So, <coughs> uh, 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 they turned around and said, uh, uh, um, uh, they said, so Allah said, right, fine then. Here you are, struck them down. So here you Zameen Dar, you Chaudhrys, you've seen all, everything, you witnessed this and you die. They all died. Musa alayhi salam thought, oh, oh, this is not good, I'm going to go down you know, on my own and they're going to say, what have you done to them? All sorts, I mean, he, you know, he thought these people are going to hear him Anyway, so he said to Allah, oh Allah, 
No, 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 please, get, bring them back. <coughs> he asked, he did dua for their life. Allah. This is a form of wasila. And yet, the Quran says, when you die, you will only be resurrected once. That's it. Once. There are only two deaths and two... Remember we covered that? فَكَيْفَ تَكْفُرُونَ كَيْفَ تَكْفُرُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَكُنْتُمْ أَمْوَاتًا فَأَحْيَاكُمْ ثُمَّ يُمِيتُكُمْ ثُمَّ يُحْيِيكُمْ ثُمَّ يُلَيْذُ Two deaths and two lives. But what's happened here? Allah's law is two deaths and two lives. So Musa alayhi salam said, yeah, yeah, I know that, I know that. <laughs> oh Allah, give them life again. Yani, oh Allah, your law is your law, but my hands are in front of you. <laughs> and the rule is, when love is in the equation, then laws are put aside. <laughs> Allah says, Musa's hands raise in front of me, my beloved Musa. How can I say no to him? Huh? How can I say no to him? ثُمَّ بَأَثْنَاكُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَوْتِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ Then we said, okay, rise again. So he allowed those people to rise again. So those people eventually died whenever they died. How many deaths did they have? Three. So they had an experience of a third death and a third life on account of the wasila of Musa a.s. And then when we say awliya come from their grave <coughs> and give fares and a spiritual blessing, if the ummatis of Musa a.s. can be resurrected, you think it's difficulty for those who are kuntum khaira ummah, the better awliya, they can't be resurrected after death. They can't be resurrected. This is... Uh, 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 and that's why, uh, forget about being resurrected, there's codes. There's codes. You know the codes? And I use the word codes because that's the world we live in. It's all about codes, isn't it? Knowing the codes. You know the codes, you solve the problem. Sarkare Ghaus Park says, Walau alqaytu sirri fawqa maytin. I know the codes. If I repeated the codes in front of a dead body, even the dead body would hear those codes and become alive again. <laughs> not I can become. <coughs> someone came to. There was a gathering, so someone said, "You know, questions and answers." Someone said, oh, "Who tell us about death?" And there were people on the right side who asked the question. He said, "Mutu die," and they all died. <laughs> and then the ones on the left, they said, oh, oh, "You killed them off." And then he says, Qum, rise, and they came. Life and death is creation, is makhluk. خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاتَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْشَنُ عَمَلًا خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ Mawt is makhluk. Mawt is a makhluk, and every makhluk is ummah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we are, kuntum khayra ummah, we are the better ummah. So the better ummah, Knows how to deal with the <laughs> other ummah. <laughs> we are not uh, uh, dominated by death, but if we know the codes, we dominate death. That's why he says, "Qum, rise!" And then the people on the left they said, "Who you? They they died and they uh, uh, you came back to life." And he says, "Mutu, you die." <laughs> and then they, he says, "Qum, they raised again." So uh, for him, he says, "Forget about me and what Allah has given me." If I was to just tell my secret in front of a dead body, the dead body could hear. Of course, we will talk about sama'ate mota, the hearing of the dead in an, on another occasion. But for now, we can say that if the awliya uh, uh, of Bani is of uh, Musa salam, if they can come back after their death, when uh, Sahabi. Uh, was uh, there was a companion of the uh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he passed away and after he passed away there were people around him and he just put his um, kafan down and he sat up and he started talking to them I'm not going to repeat the whole hadith people went to say the Aisha and said oh mother Amirul Mu'min, uh, oh uh, uh, mother of Mu'mineen what is this 
She smiled. She said, yeah, the Prophet ﷺ said, there will be ummatis of mine who will come back. <laughs> oh, no. This is just one example. There will be ummatis. It was not, oh, wow, really? Did he come back? So said, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Prophet ﷺ told us that this is viable. So uh, uh, they came back. Now, the question is, when you die, Sharia finishes, right? When you die, Sharia finishes. And when you have seen Akhirah, then there is no more Sharia. Is that right? Wa'bud Rabbaka hatta ya'tiyaka al Worship Allah until a time comes when comes to you al yaqeen according to Hazrat Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an. He says, al yaqeen al maut is death until, but although the awliya have, oh, this is a, 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 a nuclear bomb, this uh, a, a verse of the Quran, the way they have taught, al yaqeen al yaqeen comes to you. But, uh, Hazrat Abdullah ibn Masood said, al yaqeen is, one of the tafsirs of al yaqeen is death. So, yaqeen has come to these people. They have experienced, and by the way, this is not near-death experience. Un all that who are near-death experience. If you would have experienced death, then you would have found out what death is like. Yeah, yeah. So you know, if they say, "Oh, I experienced near-death experience," <laughs> I'm sorry, there's no such a thing as a near-death experience. Either you die. Yes, what you can experience is a hybrid condition in your vision. When you when your rule uh, departs from the body uh, in a way that you see it depart. And you are able to uh, 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 see certain things, and Allah allows that uh, to be possible. Normally, the rule is it only happens when you go to sleep, when you close your eyes. Now you know why the awliya practice the concept of muraqibah. They didn't close their eyes to go to sleep, it was to emancipate their soul. So they are sitting here, but they are traveling elsewhere. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so. Uh, Musa and Islam's uh, Ummatis, they became alive again. But they experienced Akhirah. They came back. Why would they be Mukallif of Sharia again? There's a question, isn't there? Why would they be Mukallif of Sharia? The answer is that they, they've, they have seen Allah. They have seen, when they uh, died, they would have, what happens when you die? Yeah? So their dream did come true in the end. <laughs> they said, we will not, until we see Allah said, right, you want to see here, you will die. لَعَلَّكُمْ <laughs> تَشْكُرُونَ So you could be thankful. So they died. And they saw Allah. They saw Jannah. They saw Jahannam. But they came back through the dua of their Rasul. <laughs> and so therefore, they were, when they came back, they were still mukallif of Sharia. To show you that being obliged by Sharia doesn't have to do with whether you are dead or alive. It is to do with whether the nabuwat of your Prophet is operative. So when they came back to life, the nabuwat of Musa Islam was operative. So they were obliged. Yet they had gone through a state, and I don't want to go into too much the sub affair, but a certain awliya have written, they had gone through a state of haqqul uh, yaqeen. Uh, you know, there's three states of yaqeen. Ilmul yaqeen, aynul yaqeen, haqqul yaqeen. These awliya had been through a status of haqqul yaqeen. They had actually experienced al yaqeen. And they were brought back. Thumma ba'athnaakum. Then after that, Allah brought them back. And all he said is, what, what was required? Don't go back and now uh, launch an Instagram campaign that I saw this and I saw this. No. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ Thank Allah. Because if you thank Him, إِذْ تَعَزَّنَ رَبُّكُمْ لَإِن كَفَرْتُمْ وَلَإِن شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ If you thank Him, He'll give you more. So those people who experienced what they experienced, when they thanked Allah, Allah gave them more status. Then He gave, يعني, he gave them more haqqul yaqeen whilst they are alive. So if people who have experienced haqqul yaqeen through Musa alayhi salam, 
What about the people in the Ummah of Rasulullah who have experienced Haqqul Yaqeen? What is their status? Anyway, let's move on. So, uh, uh, um, they, uh, uh, so, so they didn't see, they wanted to see Allah with their naked eye. But they saw Allah whilst they died. They came back. But the question here, which is raised mainly now in the modern day, because there's no such a group called Mu'tazila, but there is a group called Shia. According to Shia theology, even now, Whichever marjah you go to, uh, uh, you know, it, they all have a uniform belief that it is not possible to see Allah. They all believe that. But the Ahle Sunnah believe it is possible to see Allah. Of course, uh, uh, the seeing of Allah is based not on our power, it is based on the majesty of Allah. Or should I add a slight word like, you know, uh, 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 like lawyers often do, uh, uh, you know, put a little V there, say, not with the majesty of Allah, or not only with the majesty of Allah, but also with the choice of Allah. Why? The majesty is one thing and choice is another. Sometimes Allah's majesty is, yes, you can see me. But then his choice is, no, 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 you can't see me. When Musa alayhi salam said, Allah. Rabbi arini anzur ilayk, what is the answer? I asked this question to Peer Nasiruddin Nasir Sam alayhi rahmah. I said to him, I said, Is lantarani, if I say it in Urdu, I'll translate it in English. When he uh, blessed me when he came to the, my office in Birmingham, he said, I said, Is lantarani, Allah said to Musa, Hargiz, for sure you can never see me. Look at the sentiment here. You can. The same thing. We will never believe. You can never see me. So my question was, is lantarani associated to istitaate kaleem or manshai isdi? I'm not going to tell you his answer. The question is, is this comment by Allah that you for sure, for sure, for sure cannot see me, is that because you don't have capacity to see me? Or is it because I don't want you to see me? There's two different things, isn't it? You can't see me because you don't have the capacity to see me. And one is, you can see me, but I don't want to be shown. (laughs) So most Mufassirin, uh, most ulama of the Zahir, have translated it literally and said, no, you can't see me. Well, that's wrong. The ulama of the batin, they say, no, 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 no. What are you doing? Why? Because Musa salam could see Allah, had the power to see Allah. How? How is that possible? Well, why did he faint? فَجَعَلَهُ دَكَّنْ وَخَرَّ مُوسَى سَائِقًا if he had the capacity, why did he faint? Because when he asked, Oh Allah, I want to see you. Because naturally, when you talk to someone over the phone, the next step is that you want. <laughs> Am I stretching some raw nerves here? <laughs> I want to see you. There's many keyboard warriors. <laughs> but now I want to see you. It's a. Axiomatic, it's not normal. You want to see the Musa alayhi salam. And Allah's rule is when his beloveds raise their hands, he never says no. Allah. He didn't say, he said, you can, you can never ever see me. Look at Lantarani. But having said that, he still facilitated his ziyara. But when the ziyara was facilitated, Musa alayhi salam fainted. Anyway, we'll, we'll come on to that properly. But I just want to. Uh, 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 follow a certain trail of thought here. Musa alayhi salam, does he have, this is the question, does he have capacity to see Allah? The answer is yes. With which eyes? These eyes. So why did he faint in Tur? Why did he faint? The Prophet alayhi salatu salam told us, Inna Allah harrama ala al-ard an ta'kula ajsad al-anbiya Allah has made it haram upon the earth to touch the bodies of prophets every time I come to this hadith 
I always have to mention this point क्योंकि वो एक मजबूरी है यू नो अगर आप किसी मुफ्ती से जाके कहिए कि मुफ्ती साहब फतवा चाहिए हां हां मैं और किस काम के लिए बैठा हूं ए मुफ्ती साहब हां किस किसके लिए फतवा इन इफ ही इज इफ द प्राइस इज राइट ही विल नेम द पर्सन अदरवाइज ही उसे जैद को ये कहा हु जैद जस्ट सम रैंडम इंडिविजुअल बट इफ द प्राइस इज राइट यू से मेंशन द नेम फलाह नहीं है so uh but if you go mufti sahab i need a fatwa kis ke liye bhai wo billi ke liye fatwa chahiye mufti sahab was scratches head bhai hamara fatwa to billi pe chalta nahi hai my fatwa my jis sharia which i practice fatwa on doesn't apply to cats so you want me to write a fatwa against a cat oh, sorry i can't do that Of course if now king charles his sobat becomes more preponderant preponderant then there's a possibility that the fatwa may emerge but the rule is you cannot put a fatwa upon someone that is not mukallif mukallif means Allah. someone does does not follow the sharia a cat does not follow our sharia A dog does not follow. You can't put a fatwa on them. You can't put a fatwa on a tree. You can only put a fatwa upon someone who is mukallif of Sharia. So hormat and hilat, haram and halal apply to those who are mukallif. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says, "In Allah harama, Allah has made it haram." Yani. इस जमीन की हरमत हिलत को भी मैं जानता हूँ his body from then up till now is it even in a minute sense deteriorated according to this hadith why because allah preserves it isn't it so when musa alayhi salam will rise on the day of judgment will he be given a new set of eyes or will it be the same eyes that were in kohetur the same eyes he's buried with the same eyes he will be raised with and on the judge, a day of judgment allah says wujuhu yawma izin nadiratun ila rabbiha nazira some faces will be glittered because they will be seeing allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so if the ordinary person will see allah then badarja ula prophets will see allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in fact uh, 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 according to one hadith which i read uh, a while ago when the uh, anbiya will come out of graves they will all find their place musa alayhi salam will go right to the arsh he knows his place yeah he knows his, there's no satellite navigation required he, he will go straight to the arsh of allah and the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said i will see musa alayhi salam by the arsh of allah yeah he knows anyway So the same eye. So Musa alayhi salam on the day of is it fair now, based on this methodology, to say that Musa alayhi salam will see Allah with the same eyes that were in Kohetur? So then, what is Lantarani? You can't see me. Lantarani is not that you don't have capacity to see me. A Maliki judge nine hundred years ago solved this puzzle. Qazi Ayaz, in his Ashifa bi Hukuk al Mustafa, he wrote a book and he said, "It's not that Allah Azza wa Jal, Musa alayhi salam didn't have capacity. It's that Allah did not or not want to show the naked eyes of Musa, the Jalwa of Allah." because this privilege was reserved for muhammad rasulullah and once muhammad rasulullah has seen then everyone can see like like musa alayhi salam spoke heard allah spoke his ummati is also rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam's ummati also will have the privilege of seeing allah but allah wanted the first to be muhammad rasul 
Why? Lan Tarani has a hidden tafsir. Kidna, you haragiz, look, look how much emphasis. Haragiz, kyu? Ye mene ek khas apne mehboob ke liye rakha. But despite that, I won't refuse your dua. I will show you. Here you are. Musa alayhi salam fainted. So the fainting, and yet, Musa alayhi salam fainted at Tur, but he won't faint on the day of judgment. <laughs> Then you will ask Musa, what happened there? And what happened here? The eyes are the same. He will say, there, there was a reservation. <laughs> and I was in a queue. <laughs> that was reserved for my boss, Muhammad Rasulullah. So Musa alayhi salam, uh, uh, so, however, whilst we're on this topic of narallah, to see Allah, there is a hadith which of people often quote. Uh, they say that say that Aisha radiallahu anha says that he who says that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam saw Allah lied. He who says that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam saw Allah lied, and uh, they use because Hazrat Abdullah ibn Abbas, uh, his mawqif was that he saw Allah, but some people try to create fitna and say, well, say that Aisha said no. Ce n'est pas possible. But when you look at a da'wa, da'wa means a claim, you have to look at the particulars of claim. And in the particulars of claim, you have to have the evidence, right? If there's no evidence in the particulars, is this a raw subject? Your particulars will be struck out. You can't just say, he did this and he did this and he did this and he did this. Judges will say, where's your evidence? So every claim must be accompanied with dalil. Every da'wah must be accompanied with dalil. We don't say that Hazrat Sayyida Aisha, Ummul Mu'mineen radiallahu anha, her da'wah was wrong, her da'wah was correct, but we will uh, uh, um, uh, rationalize her da'wah based on her dalil. And what was her dalil? She quoted a verse of the Quran. The Quran says, La tudrikuhul absar. No eye can encapsulate Allah. And so those people who say, See, he didn't see on the night of Miraj. They say, Well, there you are. La tudrikuhul absar. No eye can encapsulate Allah. Do you, do you understand the point? That I, no eye can encapsulate Allah. Therefore, but then that would go against the verse of the Quran when Allah says, Certain faces will be glittered when they see Allah. And there's so many hadith, sahih hadith, where Allah Azza wa Jal talks about uh, 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 the people of Jannah doing ziyara of Allah. Do, do, do you see the point I'm trying to make? So, and, and then uh, on every chapter of the Quran, there's talk about. فَمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُوا لِقَاءَ رَبِّي To meet Allah. Liqa isn't just to meet Him the way we meet Him now in namaz. Actually, we don't meet Him. We meet Tom, Dick or Harry, although we say Allahu Akbar. But uh, uh, um, the, the whole objective of liqa is to meet Allah. So, Sayyidah Aisha's claim was substantiated by the verse no I can see Allah, but actually that's not the verse. The verse is La Tudrikuhul Absar. It doesn't say no I can see, it says no I can encapsulate Allah. Look, I can encapsulate this mic. Can I? No, I can't. I can't see behind it. <laughs> but if I see a three-dimensional four-dimensional, five-dimensional object, I am able to, even though we don't have, uh, our eyesight is at maximum, uh, three-dimensional or four-dimensional? Three. three. We're stuck at three. But the Prophet and their, their eyes are not three-dimensional. And if I say to you, um, look and count the windows of your house. You say, oh, sorry, uh, no, no, not your house, any house. Count the wind, look and, I can't count the back windows. I can't count the side windows. I have to look 
to count the windows. But after the night of Mi'raj, when the mushrikeen said, how many windows of Al-Aqsa? He didn't say, uh, let me just ask Jibreel. Ya Allah, please show me. No. He looked. And it was in a three-dimensional look. It was a multi-dimensional look that he saw every window, counted every window and told them the answer. Wow. Wow. <laughs> multi-dimensional. Anyway, so um, uh, uh, Musa alayhi uh, salam, sorry, what was I saying? The, 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 uh, huh? No, I can encapsulate him. No, I can encapsulate him. That's correct. No, I can encapsulate him. Why? Because to encapsulate something, you have to be dominant over it, right? To, look, I cannot, I just admit it to you, I can't encapsulate this mic. Why? Because my eye is limited to one side. I can't see the back of it. So in order to encapsulate, you have to be able to have multi-dimensional vision. You cannot encapsulate Allah, because Allah has no beginning and has no ending. Do you see? And makhluk, uh, creation, whoever it is, has a beginning and has an ending. So what Hazrat Sayyidah Aisha was referring to is that you cannot encapsulate Allah. Why? Because he has no beginning and no ending. She didn't say he didn't see Allah. Allah. Seeing is, why? Because even the people of Jannah will see Allah. But the real door of seeing Allah through naked eyes was. And that's why... Um, uh, in the uh, Masnavi Sharif, uh, Jalaluddin Rumi says, he says, Musa zehosh raft yak jalvaye sifat. Musa alayhi salam only saw one uh, uh, tajalla of Allah and he fainted. Musa, and that, that uh, tajalla, majesty that he saw, wasn't the essence of Allah, it was an attribute of Allah. Huh? It was an attribute of Allah. So he says, Musa zehoshraft yak jalvaye sifat. Musa saw one attribute of Allah and he fainted. And he says, Ya Rasulullah, tu ene zat mi nagri dar tabassami. He said, You saw the essence of Allah and you still smiled. <laughs> Why? Ma, you know, when you look at the sun, your eye flints, isn't it? He said, No, you saw Allah. Ma zagal basaru wa ma taga. Your eye did not, you know when you see immense light, your eye flints and it moves away. Taga, it moves away. The Prophet Allah, Allah says in the Quran, Ma zagal basar, beloved, when you saw Allah, you didn't squint, you didn't look away. Why? You saw through His authorization what He allowed you to see and therefore you saw. So, Seeing Allah is not an impossible task. So, uh, we'll just finish with uh, 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 the Ummah of Rasulullah Because these were uh, uh, the uh, Ummah of uh, Musa alayhi salam. These were the Ummah of Musa alayhi salam. Now let me give you an example of the Ummah of Rasulullah sallallahu So one day there was a Waliya. Her name was Sayyida Rabia Basriya. The mother of the female awliya of the uh, Ummah of Rasulullah Rabia al well, and an amazing biography. When I uh, look at her biography, I, it reduces, one reduces to tears. Who she was, what society she grew up in, and what she became. Oh. Sayyidah Rabia one day said to Allah, Oh Allah, I want to see you. <laughs> oh Allah, I want to see you. Allah responded to her, Have you not, heard, have you not read Lantarani? <laughs> she said, That was Musa, I'm Rabia. <laughs> That was Musa. The door is open now. I'm Rabia. So Allah then um, said, I don't know whether any of you have re- uh, heard this shir of Mirza Ghalib. He proper nicked this uh, uh, concept from uh, this vaqya. He says, uh, you know nowadays when we proclaim love, uh, although it's all messed up with Bollywood and Hollywood anyway, but he says, uh, he says uh, your love is in my veins. It's everywhere. Ah, this is the modern concept. Your love has dominated every part of my body. As if. <laughs> As if. Yeah. Only find out two years later when it dominates someone else's. <laughs> anyway, I said, Your love dominates my mind. So, Ghalib, Mirza Ghalib, Asadullah Khan Ghalib, he says, Rago me dolte pirne ke hum nahi kail. You know, you say that your love uh, is in my veins. He says, 
ہم نہیں قائل جو آنکھ ہی سے نہ ٹپکے تو پھر لہو کیا ہے انٹل یو ڈون اسٹارٹ بلیڈنگ ٹیئرز آف بلڈ When I read this in Ghalib, uh, I, I, uh, Professor Matthews was uh, reciting this, and he was uh, in London University, and uh, he was reciting this here, and he was giving his own spin on it. I thought, I thought Mirza Ghalib, I said, Bale, Bale, Bale. You nicked this share, and everyone gave da'at to Mirza Ghalib, thinking this is an original thought of Mirza Ghalib. He nicked it from Rabia Basriya. Why? Because when Rabia Basriya said, Oh Allah, I want to see you, Allah said, Okay, look, she saw a, an ocean of blood. And she said, What's this? <coughs> Allah said, This is a collection of those tears of blood that poured in anticipation of wanting to look at me. Bring the, you know, you cry and cry and cry. I'm not talking about the cry when you go to do a source. You know, because outside you're having a laugh and the moment you're in oh, I'm very sorry to hear. <coughs> I'm not talking about that crying. I've seen that many a times. Oh, 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 oh. It's an art, that is. You know, she, she was laughing and joking. I said, as soon as she went in the house of the Martha, it was like, oh my goodness. You know, it's like, I could not believe it. It's just a schizo personality. Anyway, so, um, they... You know when you cry, you cry, you cry, you cry, a time comes when blood comes from your eyes. Wow. And Ra- Allah said, Rabia, the, this ocean you see is the blood that came from those eyes that wanted to see me. Wow. First bring such an ocean and then come and see me. Wow. So, Mirza Ghalib nicked it from here. Rago mein daur te pirne ke hum nahi qail Jo aank hi se na tapke تو پھر لہو کیا ہے اف یو ریلی کنفیس ٹو لو دین فرسٹ شو می ٹیئرز آف بلڈ امیجن دیٹ لائن فار آل دوز پرسپیکٹو یو آر کنسڈرنگ ہو کلیم دے لو یو ہو سی ڈارلنگ کین یو شو می ٹیئرز آف لو آل ٹیل یو واٹ ٹیئرز آف شو یو یا نو ایبسلیوٹلی سو نر اللہ To see Allah is not an unreasonable request. They saw Allah, but not through their naked eye. So Allah fulfilled their desire, and then they uh, 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 rose again. And Musa a.s. said, no, let's go back. Now you can tell people where you've been. You heard Allah. You saw me. You died. You met Allah. You saw Jannah. You saw Jahannam. And when they went back, they told people, yes, we've been there. Not near death experience, we've been there. But still Bani Israel said, no, sorry. We're not going to rely on your testimony. And that's exactly what happens today. We see in front of us a miracle of the magnitude, the greatest miracle of all times, Al-Quran. But we say, no, show us, proof. But Allah says, come, I'll, pr- I'll show you. But you have to come. If you don't come, You know what they say, an old Aussie saying, what you don't ask for, you don't get. Man jadda wajada, or as the Egyptians say, man jadda wajada. <laughs> man jadda, whatever you seek, you find. If you want Allah, you'll find Allah. But the way of finding Allah is to find His signs. And the greatest sign was Muhammad Rasulullah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he bought the ultimate sign, Al-Furqan. وَمَا عَلَيْنَا إِلَّا الْبَلَاغُ